Hey everyone, and welcome to today's video. In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to make calculated aggressive plays. This is a very important skill to learn as you improve, because as you climb the ladder, your opponents will get better and better at bluffing. The idea behind bluffing is that they can prevent you from pushing an advantage through pretending to be confident. However, if you can learn to spot their bluff and then call them on it, you can make them look incredibly foolish and either double or triple your advantage. As we break down the landing phase, there's going to be a few points where I take a good look at my opponent and decide that there's no way that they can win a fight that they're picking. As the fights are set up, I'll narrate my decision making as usual and give you pointers about how you can make the same clutch calls. With that all said, our missions in this video are going to kick in after we secure a lead, so don't follow these until you have a significant lead over your opponent. These missions are, check your lead, check the minion wave, rule out third parties, call the play, and if none of these make sense yet, don't worry, I'll be explaining each as they happen. With that said, let's hop right into the game. In this game, we're playing Ezreal and Low Diamond, with a Soraka support against Varus and Morgana. Quad range lane means that everyone is going to be punished easily, and everyone kind of does a lot of damage, which is my favorite kind of lane. Anyway, we start things off with a standard 140 leash, and we leave at the regular time. I compared Soraka to Morgana and see that I have a sustain advantage, so I'm allowed to trade my health for minion damage, and I'm also allowed to take small trades with Varus. As an aside, the second Morgana uses her Q, she's no longer an issue in lane for 9 seconds, which is one of those critical cooldowns similar to Thresh Q, Blitzcrank Hook, and Braum Q. In this instance, I'm just going for more minion damage, but if I had already had more minion damage, I could really push for punishing either of them with Morgana Q down. And as these three melees get taken down on both sides, we're going to all hit level 2. Level 2 comes up and Morgana is going aggressive. I'm fully ready for her to go aggressive on me, and I've got my E skilled up, and I'm ready to use it after I see the projectile come from her Q. However, she does something really sick here that you should all copy if you play supports with abilities like hers or really any champion period. She's looking like she's going to look at me, right? But instead, she spins 90 degrees and she aims it at Soraka, who isn't expecting it at all. Granted, Soraka should also be really conscious of this because players aren't like RPG mobs and aggro isn't really a thing in MOBAs, but at the end of the day, she's going to get caught and killed here. We won't overanalyze this fight because that's not what this video is about, but Varus extends for the kill on Soraka, and I fight 1v2 to kill Varus, and I just barely miss a kill on Morgana. I should have actually autoed her one last time, but I was overly worried about dying and went for a poor Q instead. However, we were able to get a pretty sweet flash dodge. Anyway, this means that the only summoner spell left after all of this is my teleport. Now, let's take a quick stock of things as I teleport back into lane. Information gathering like this is a really important skill that will give you a lot of advantages over players who autopilot through everything. Typically, the most important things to look for are levels, items, waves, and jungler positioning. In early game, where people have few items and the differences aren't big, I look at XP first, since a level gives you a lot more effective combat stats than, say, the value of 200 gold. With this in mind, Morgana is level 3 to Rasoraka is level 2, and I'm level 2 to Varus is level 2. However, doing a quick calculation, I know that Varus hit level 2 and then died soon after killing Soraka, and at that time I assume he was about one third of the way into level 2, and the quick deduction you can make from that is that Varus won't be level 3 anytime soon. Jumping back into real time though, I'm a couple minions from level 3, and I will be level 3 when Varus gets here. Considering that, it will be a level 3 Ezreal and a level 2 Soraka against a level 2 Varus and a level 3 Morgana. In most cases, Marksman levels are more important for 2v2s, unless it's a non-traditional bruiser support or a mage support like Brand. But anyway, just off of making these quick insights from XP totals on both sides, I know that Varus won't stand a chance against me in a fight. We also know for a fact that most players would let Varus hit the minion wave here. I personally know this because Varus is doing a bluff that I consistently do that works in lower elo brackets. The idea is that if you walk up and act really confidently, it's harder for the opponent to call your bluff. But what is really stopping me from attacking Varus here? Let's consult our missions. So we've already gauged our XP lead, and we'll next take a look at the minions. Will these four casters really stop me from being aggressive? In this case, since they're in tower range, they won't. 
And so third, we'll rule out any third party interventions like a jungler, mid laner, or top laner teleporting in. We see that both the enemy jungler and the top laner are up top fighting our top and jungler, and the mid laner is fighting as well. With all these things considered, let's call the play. Making these decisions beforehand easily lets me make all of the micro movements in this fight. Knowing I win the fight, I can have the confidence to E forward to dodge Varus's E. And then the difference in health and knowing that I have some sustain support from Soraka gives me the confidence to take the next minion wave, and with Morgana binding down, I'll also know that she's useless for the rest of the fight. Calling this bluff was simple because I did the prep work beforehand. I checked my lead, then assessed the factors within the lane, and then I considered if anyone else was going to be joining the fight. After that, it was a pretty easy choice for me to go aggressive. Another place where people move forward, and this is more subconscious in my opinion, is when there's a new wave. We get told frequently that minion waves equal safety, and that's not really true. Minion waves add more power to your side of the lane, but they aren't a catch-all tool. I'd like to highlight that not only is he half health, but Varus is still level 2 to my level 3. What really stops me from going aggressive here? Well, nothing. Varus could have easily died here if the variables were a little bit different, which means that his confidence in the minion wave, whether conscious or subconscious, was a big mistake. So with these two examples out of the way, let's skip to another one that happens just a few minutes later. Just so you're clued into what's happened in the meantime, Trundle ganked, we traded one for one, and now my lead over Varus is about the same as it was before. So anyway, let's look at the checklist. The lead is the same, as we mentioned, and the minion wave is pretty big for him, but the turret will kill a lot of them eventually. We have no vision on the top laner or the jungler, but the chances of a teleport are fairly low, and Trendle isn't a super high threat champion. The conclusion here is that because the minion wave is large for him, we'll check back here in about 10 seconds. Taking a look at the minions again, there's another new wave. The difference between this situation and the one that we looked at earlier in the same spot is that there's significantly more minions, which make this a lot more dangerous for me to opt into. However, with each minion that dies, I can think about whether or not I have an opportunity. And now, with just three minions left, just like we had earlier, it's time to call Varus's bluff. I again E forward on him, though I don't dodge his E this time, and I go for a Q flash here because I want to avoid the Morgana Q while also catching Varus if he flashes backwards. So we're able to kill Varus pretty quickly, and then Morgana also gives up on life, and at this point I've built a really significant lead purely through calling these overaggressive bluffs from Varus. I'm able to do it over and over again because it's hard for someone to change their play like that mid-game because they often don't even realize what they're doing wrong. So anyway, let's move forward another minute to after we've both reset. Varus is down 1900 gold to me, which is a really devastating disadvantage at 10 minutes into the game, and yet I see players fail to capitalize on leads that are even this large. So we're going to break down how I would capitalize on it. So if Varus commits to last hitting a minion here, I will kill him. He's also smart enough to know that I'll do that, and he instead goes for a max range Q. I fail to hop over it, but that actually gives him the confidence to turn around and ult me. The problem is that I've already gone through my mental checklist and I know that I'll win this fight as long as I hit my cues. So he goes down and he looks a little bit silly for turning around, but I want to point out that I didn't even play this insanely well. This was after a short vacation and I was pretty rusty, but when you make the right decisions and you pick extremely high percentage fights, you don't need insane mechanics. And if you think through the fight before you even take it, it's easy to look miles better than your opponent. And in the end, the proof is in the gold lead. At just 14 minutes in the game, I have a near 4,000 personal gold lead, and I've contributed significantly to building a massive lead for Nocturne and his jungle matchup. These results were based around the idea of calling someone's bluff. In the end, this Varus is a top 1% player, but by calling his bluffs over and over again and also understanding when he was too far forward, I was able to make him look like a much worse player than he is. This was all built off of a 1 for 1 trade that happened in the early game. I capitalized on it well, but the true strength I had in this lane was using my advantage in an effective way. 
We'll have the next active mission out about this soon, so stay tuned for that video coming out shortly. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.